Can you answer the following three questions about ancient China? If you can't, and if you're interested, maybe you have a reason to keep watching. This short lecture, this video, will be chronologically organized, so it should be rather easy to follow. Let's start. Ancient China can be understood as successions of dynasties. Dynasties are a special form of monarchy in which the ruler comes from a single family line. Ancient China saw the following three dynasties, the Xia, Shang, and Zhao. And skipping the periods before the Xia since it's accepted by many to be rather mythological. Okay, so the Xia dynasty, they rule from around 2100 to 1700 BC and is the oldest dynasty according to traditional Chinese historiography. However, the actual existence of such dynasty is contested among scholars. And if so, you might be wondering why I'm introducing this instead of the periods before this dynasty, right? Well, it's, be it's because there's this one idea, this one custom that seems to start during this time period, which influences all later Chinese history. And that's the idea of dynastic rule. Legend has it that the founder of Xia, called Yu the Great, established this custom of dynastic rule. Regardless of whether this is all factually true in a scientific and objective sense, the fact that this was believed by many makes it important enough to know, I think. The key takeaway of the Xia dynasty is that the idea of dynastic rule starts. The next ancient dynasty is the Shang. This is actually the first reliable dynasty and they rule from around 1700 to 1100 BC. Some information, although not too important to remember, is that the Shang is said to be the first literate dynasty in the east of Mesopotamia. And just for comparison, the Mesopotamians were literate by 3000 BC, so there's at least a difference of a thousand years between the Mesopotamians and the Chinese. Now the Shang also invented a calendar that would be the basis of all later Chinese calendars up to modern time. So the Shang was quite advanced and had great culture and technology. The most important thing I want to mention about the Shang is that the Shang dynasty formed a religion around the highest god called Shangdi. As with all other ancient civilizations I've covered, the political and religious arena was deeply intertwined. The king was believed to have direct connection with Shangdi, and the king was divinely chosen. In this way, the king's legitimacy was maintained. The term Shangdi encapsulates meanings such as highest deity and first deity. And if I were to urge you to remember one thing, just one thing of the Shang, it would be this. The term Shangdi was conflated with the term heaven by the end of the Shang dynasty. And this is super important. A lot of my information is from this book. The link is in the description box, so feel free to check it out. Okay, so now um, China is a big place, right? Which meant that along with the Shang Dynasty, there were other groups of people as well. And one important group was the Zhao Dynasty. The Zhao used to pay tribute to the Shang. But at the Battle of Muye in 1045 BC, the Zhao defeated the Shang. 
Before this battle, you have to understand that the Zhao were under Shang rule, which meant that the religion of Shang, or the idea of Shang Di, was quite known, ultimately granting sovereignty to the Shang. So, what justified the overthrowing of the Shang? Well, an important deviation of theology appears in the Zhao dynasty. And this is called the Mandate of Heaven. And yes, for those of you who realized, the term heaven is referring to Shandi. Basically, the idea of the Mandate of Heaven is this a leader will be mandated by heaven and he will create a great dynasty. And this great dynasty will later be corrupted by evil men. And when this happens, the heaven will mandate a new leader who will rise up against the evil men. As you can tell, this idea presented by the Zhao places an importance on moral virtue and not just divine appointment. In a sense, the Shangs didn't really care too much about moral virtue when it came to the legitimacy. Of the dynasty and the king. So, this idea of the mandate of heaven justified the Zhao's overthrowing the Shang because the Shang was basically being evil in the Zhao's eyes. So, now Zhao was the ruling dynasty um, after the Battle of Mue. They ruled until 256 BC. And they are the longest lasting dynasty in all of Chinese history and became the model of later Chinese dynasty for exactly this reason. Politically, the Zhao was quite stable, most probably because of the idea of the mandate of heaven. And what I mean is,、um, in order for a king to keep the mandate of heaven, the king had to be just. And work for the good of the whole state. And this idea led to the officials also being trained in moral virtue. The Zhao also worked towards a functioning meritocracy, which explains why they kept records of everything. They took meritocracy really, really seriously, to the point of re- recording things three times. Three times in order to hedge against losing records. That's pretty intense. Although Zhao Dynasty was long lasting, they did have their own social political problems. In a nutshell, the kingdom of Zhao split into fragments, which caused social political unrest. This background was conducive. To the development of later Chinese intellectual and philosophical thought, marked by the era called the Hundred Schools of Thought, which lasted from 6th century BC to 221 BC. During the Hundred Schools of Thought period, as suggested by the name, Many intellectual and philosophical ideas were developed and experimented with the hopes of solving the social political unrest and with the hopes of understanding society better. It was both an intellectual and practical pursuit. One of the most favored schools of thought was the legalists. These guys fundamentally believed that humans were evil and that a state must be ruled by laws and punishments, not by moral virtue. Other famous schools of thought include Taoism, Mahism, and Confucianism. Each school of thought fought for influence, and as you can probably guess, Confucianism eventually won this race. So, being of such importance, let's talk a bit about Confucius. His name was Kong Q, 
born in 551 BC in Shandong, which is a place northeast of North China Plain, and he died in 479 BC. He lost his father at a young age, was raised by his mother, and he was most probably trained as a bookkeeper. This meant he grew up surrounded by scholars. Along the way, he realized that rulers were not just, and he tried to teach them, but couldn't find a way to teach the rulers. So he instead focused on teaching the general populace. One of the hallmarks of Confucius' teachings was a revival of traditional teachings, especially those stemming from early Zhao Dynasty. Specifically, he focused on moral virtue, which, if you can recall, was central to the idea of Zhao's mandate of heaven. In essence. All of his teachings were aimed at virtue ethics, which is to become a morally good and virtuous person. As his aim was virtue ethics, he taught and believed things such as treating others as you would want to, and that everyone has a natural role in society. One colossal achievement of Confucius is the compilation of the Thirteen Classics, which is a collection of books which were to become. The central source of which China was to build its civilization. In this respect, the importance of the Thirteen Classics to China is similar to that of the Bible for Western civilization, although one is secular and one religious. After Confucius died, we enter the Warring States, which is from 481 to 221 BC. Which you know, and this period was ironically marked by everything opposing what Confucius was for. As mentioned earlier, during the later times of Zhao Dynasty's rule, China saw social political strife. Specifically, Zhao's sovereignty, which is the ability to exercise power. Was weakening, although Zhao was still seen as the legitimate ruler of China. The Warring States period was a time of intense war between seven key dynasties, which sprang forth due to the political unrest and thirst for power. This period ends in 221 BC, when the Qin Dynasty unifies China and becomes the first empire in Chinese history. Before we end this lecture, I want to mention two noteworthy changes and innovations that appeared during this time, which would steer China's future. The first is iron casting. It was performed by about 500 BC, whereas this technique only appears in other parts of the world from around 15th century AD. So the Chinese were at least 2,000 years earlier. Second. Is the physical manifestation of social hierarchy. Cities were now made with three basic areas, with the innermost for the aristocrats, next one for craftsmen and merchants, and the final outermost area was for farmers and the like. If you made it this far, I'm assuming you learned something from this video. Please hit the like button as it helps my channel. And to check your understanding on ancient China, maybe you can pause the video and, in the comment section, write down your answers to the questions I asked at the start of this video. And that's it for ancient China.